Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Kate Bunting. I uh, am just formally the CEO of HelpAge Internet or HelpAge USA here uh, in Washington. And I want to welcome everybody to the SID conference this year. It's been amazing to be a part of it thus far. And I'm really just amazed at how much this has uh, come uh, along, uh, given some of the hurdles that were put in front of the team as they were putting it together. I am um, on behalf of the SID board. I'm um, really privileged today to introduce this uh, panel on the digital strategy going forward. And I'm going to just introduce Manisha Ariel from Chemonix, who is going to be your moderator, who has spent uh, you know, more than 25 years doing information um, uh, systems and looking at digital technologies. And I'm sure it's changed quite a bit uh, in the time during your career, particularly uh, almost in just the last nine months. So Manisha, take it away. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, wherever you are tuning in from, for our panel on USAID's digital strategy today. My name is Manisha Ariel, and I'm the Technical Director for Digital Development at Kimonix. So earlier this year, USAID launched its first ever digital strategy. The strategy is an agency-wide vision that outlines USAID's commitment to improving development and humanitarian assistance outcomes. The 50-page strategy charts how, relying on best practices and a body of evidence, USAID is envisioning changing the way we do development. We're already integrating digital into our lives, as you can see. Not only is digital transforming the way in which the world interacts, it's also changing the ways in which development outcomes are achieved. In places we work, we are, each of us, harnessing the power of digital to include, to inspire, and to be impactful. Digital is helping us transcend boundaries imposed by geography, ideology, security, and now the pandemic to stimulate growth and to bring about prosperity. So from our panelists today, we will hear what all the digital team at the Center for Digital Development at the USAID Global, Div uh, Global Digital <laughs> Development Lab has been up to. Too many Ds. <laughs> we will learn about key tools USAID is rolling out or is in the process of doing so, and what that means for USAID partners and implementers. I'm delighted and honored to introduce our distinguished panel today. We have Michelle Parker, who's the Senior Policy Advisor in the Center for Digital Development and manages the implementation of USAID's digital strategy. She's a Career Foreign Service Officer with technical expertise in crisis and stabilization and specializes in advancing democracy human rights and governance in conflicts and closing political spaces. We also have Krista Batista, Senior Director at DI Center for Digital Acceleration. Krista leads DI's integration of digital solutions across the organization and manages the company's digital portfolio, including providing technical oversight for the Digital Frontiers Project, under which DI supports USAID's digital strategy implementation. And last, but not the least, we have Craig Joly, who is a data scientist at the Center for Digital Development. Craig leads the development of the Digital Ecosystem Country Assessment, or DECA. DECA is intended as a tool to help USAID missions understand their digital operating environment, focusing on issues of digital infrastructure, access, governance, finance, and trade. Welcome, Michelle, Krista, and Craig. I'm really looking forward to the next 50 minutes. And greetings also to our audience. We are so pleased you could join us today. And a few housekeeping notes before we begin. We invite you to drop your questions in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat for questions and we'll get the panelists to answer as many questions on the digital strategy and its implementation as time permits. Please note that this session is being recorded. The recording will be available online on this platform until January and after that on the Sid Washington YouTube channel for future access. With that, my first question goes to Michelle. Michelle, please, can you walk us through the first ever digital strategy from the USA? How does the agency intend to go about achieving the strategy's goals? And what should the audience be expecting to see in the next five years? Sure, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. And I did want to thank Sid 
Washington for inviting us to speak at this panel. It's an honor and I, I hope that we can answer some of the questions that you and the audience have. Um, so I did bring a few slides. I am a government employee that happens. So why don't we put those up and I can walk you briefly through um, some of the key points of the strategy. Um, the first is, is really focusing on our strategy's goal. I'll, I'll let you read it. Um, I do wanna emphasize three key words in the strategy is open, secure, and inclusive. If you remember anything about our strategy, it's those three words that are driving everything that we're doing. Open means everything from open internet to open source. Uh, secure, of course, you should be able to use digital tools securely without concerns around surveillance, but it also means that you have the skills to understand how to operate digital technology securely. And finally, inclusive. We want to make sure everyone, regardless of gender, regardless of religion, regardless of physical location, has access to digital technology. So those are really the three core words that you should think about when you think about USAID's digital strategy. Now, how we're going to do this is through two objectives. If you could please go to the next slide. We have two separate but mutually reinforcing objectives. The first one is, as you can see, focused on the responsible use of digital technology. We really do come from a do no harm approach. We are not saying do digital just for the sake of digital, but rather we're in a digital revolution. Therefore, it's the responsibility of USAID and our partner staff to be able to assess the technology, to determine the risks and the opportunities and make informed decisions about how to use that technology responsibly. As you can see in objective one, it is focused on USAID and our implementing partners. And this is really focused on programming. I wanna be very, very clear that when we say USAID, we are not talking about our internal enterprise system. That's our fabulous CIO shop. They have that hand we're talking here about USAID folks like me. I'm a democracy rights and governance officer. I design programs in countries and I wanna make sure the technical staff or rather the strategies focused on the technical staff being able to design and execute programs using technology responsibly. And this ties directly into our second objective, which is strengthening the digital ecosystem of our partner nation. Now, I'm not going to go into the weeds on the ecosystem. I'll leave that to my colleague, Dr. Jolly. Um, but fundamentally, this is working with our civil society partners, our partner governments and private sector, both local private sector, as well as American and other national companies to really focus on, again, open, inclusive and secure digital ecosystem. So we as development practitioners, we need to understand that technology as we develop programs to support our partner nations. So that's how the two strategy objectives work together and they are mutually reinforcing. Um, one other key point in the strategy is that everything that we frame is in terms of risks versus opportunities. We really want our, our, our development sector to think through here are potential risks, how can we mitigate those? Here are potential opportunities, how can we seize them? And when is it right to take no action because the risks might be too much or the opportunities may not be enough? And that's part of what we're really trying to focus on in the next five years. So if you could please go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about our implementation approach. This is a lot. It is a lot, I'm managing this, so believe me, it is a lot. <laughs> we have four implementation tracks and underneath each track, you see what we call initiatives. For our management structure, just please understand each one of these initiatives has a separate manager. And for example, Craig is managing the first one under the first track, the digital ecosystem country assessment. Each one of these has managers and teams underneath it to build these out. So even though this might look somewhat simple, it's actually a really complex, large operation with 30, 40 people executing the strategy um, together in USAID with the support of DAI and other partners. So we have four implementation tracks. And the first one is talking about adopting an ecosystem approach. And as you can see, it's things like creating an ecosystem assessment. If we're asking our, implement, if we're asking our, our missions to say, you really need to start programming in digital, 
they need to understand what the digital ecosystem is, what kind of infrastructure exists, what are the challenges around governance or what are the opportunities? And of course, the um, economic ecosystem, which Craig will get into. We have an ecosystem fund, which is for USAID missions to apply to funds that we manage in Washington to um, basically program in opportunities or risks that they did not know were in existence when they created their five-year strategic plans. As we know, digital is very fast moving. So we wanted to make sure that there were funds available for our missions to be able to rapidly respond when opportunities or risks arise. We're working with each of our regional bureaus and technical sectors to develop visions. As Manisha said, we had about a 50 page strategy, so we could not get into depth on health dynamics, right? We couldn't talk about issues around environment that deeply. So we're really working with those technical sectors and of course the regions to say, what is the visions? What are the action plans you want to see in these areas to really build it out? And we do have a very robust learning agenda. We are all about learning and iteration. This is again, a very fast moving space. And so we wanted to really highlight the L in, in MEL and learning and, and, and constantly improving what we're doing. The second track is about helping partners navigate the risks and rewards or risks and opportunities. The easiest way to understand this is these are five new, new areas. I say new in quotes because we've been working on these, but we're, we're making them much more strategic that USAID will be building out our technical expertise in programming. So we are very much dedicated on closing the digital gender divide. We've worked on this for years, but we're elevating our work in this space. Digital literacy, of course, is everywhere and everything. And we really wanted to focus on what is USAID's role in helping execute digital literacy in our programming. Mitigating cyber harms and increasing data privacy protections, again, as technical areas that we will be helping our partner nations in developing themselves. And then when we put the strategy up for uh, public feedback, we got a lot of comments around, you really need to call out the protection of children from digital harm. And so we talked with our DRG Center colleagues, Democracy Rights and Governance Center colleagues, and agreed that we needed to have a special initiative just focused on children. So again, those are technical areas that we're gonna be building out as an agency. The third is shifting to digital by default. And it might be probably one of the more interesting areas for this audience, because this is all about the requirements that we're going to be doing um, and strong suggestions to have our partners start operating with a digital by default approach. And this includes mandating that all partners shift to digital payments. It's actually a mandate already from uh, 2014, but again, we're re-elevating it and we want to hear from our partners around where are your pain points? What's not working? How can we help you? Um, digital data collection. Again, we all know the values around collecting digital uh, data digitally. And as you all know, USAID will soon be requiring all data coming in to be digital. So we we're also trying to take it to that front end of collection. The principles for digital development need to be integrated in everything through our procurement process as well as the implementation of our activities. And then the cybersecurity and data privacy and digital literacy pieces are for our partners to think about their own enterprise systems and how to be working on those. And again, these we have to develop. These are very early, obviously a lot of work with uh, our OAA colleagues and GC and others. So this one is really um, one of our more long-term approaches as far as our work with partners. Um, and then finally, building USAID of tomorrow is about investing in our own staff. And this is really going again to objective one. Um, we know in missions that we all have our hands quite full. So we are creating new positions of digital development advisors that will hopefully be in every single mission around the world by the end of the strategy, where their job is to really support the implementation of the strategy and support the missions and understanding the digital development space. Um, we have an executive fellowship program for USAID staff to go do professional development. We're doing a lot of investment in skills, all of track two. We're producing various products that will be going into uh, skills training. And finally, we have a senior level officer internally to help coordinate. So, that was a lot of information um, and hopefully it gives you a flavor of what we're going to be doing on implementation. I would say the big takeaway from this is 
Years one and two of our strategy are about laying a foundational approach through landscaping, through hearing from our partners, what, you know, what's going on, what are your challenges, what's working. And then that's going to really provide the groundwork basis for us to be able to scale our interventions in years three through five. So that's where we really want to make sure every mission has conducted a DECA, every mission has a digital development advisor. Most of our staff have gone through training. We have robust think pieces that are grounding our thinking and approach and being done in conjunction with our partners. Um, so that's a, a quick overview of our strategy and where we are right now. Thanks, Manisha. Thank you for that excellent overview, Michelle. I love the digital strategies holistic approach. You know, my background, as you know, is in media development and most recently in Ukraine. And, you know, long focused on media ecosystems, including digital information and disinformation ecosystems. So the strategies ecosystem approach really resonated with me personally. So I love it. <laughs> and the acknowledgement that while digital presents like unprecedented like, opportunities, it also comes with risks in terms of like widening the existing gender gaps, in terms of literacy and access, and to, in terms of data privacy and online security. It's a very thoughtful take on the integration of dig digital and um, a lot to sort of mull over and digest. So um, thank you for that. Um, and I'm now going to turn to Krista here. Um, so Krista, uh, you know, from the implementer's point of view, tell us why the digital strategy is important. You know, moving forward, what all should USAID implementing partners be paying attention to in terms of existing and future projects? Thanks, Manisha, and hello to everyone that's joining us. I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be here to join the panel. Um, and thanks to Sid Washington for organizing this conference um, and for bringing us together. I share your joy, Manisha, about the digital <laughs> strategy. Um, and really having been in this field uh, for the last 15 years or so, um, I see this as a really important turning point and a really important moment in time, um, both for USA and for implementing partners um, like DAI, uh, where I lead our Center for Digital Acceleration. Um, you know, we what I find so um, uh, empowering and so important about the strategy is if we look at the two objectives and the tracks, it provides us with both this vision of, of insight into how digital is changing development and the way that we work and the, the realities that many of us that work in digital see on the ground. Um, but it also provides these practical tools, right, and practical ways that we as implementing partners can engage with the strategy and can, um, and, and can use the ideas and the um, opportunities that it presents to improve our work, um, as you mentioned. And it really couldn't have come at a better time, given uh, the changes we've seen this year, the impacts of COVID-19, um, and really the both the opportunities, but also the, the challenges in making sure that we're not leaving people behind and that we are being responsible in our rollout of digital uh, to programs. So I wanted to highlight four um, opportunities or four critical pieces for implementing partners to keep in mind. There are many more of these. And so I look forward to continuing to engage um, uh, with all of you and with all of the, the people that are participating and that view this um, in this space. First, I wanted to talk about um, encouraging digital self-reliance. Um, and in order to scale and, uh, and create you know, sustainable digital interventions, uh, tying back into the principles for digital development, we really need to, from the outset, link our digital activities to the needs um, and the capacities of the institutions that we're working with around the globe. Um, and, and to do that, we need to build trust and ownership in the digital strategy, in the principles for digital development, um, and really engage from the outset. So some examples of this may be, you know, for working with mobile network operators, um, engaging them so they can partner with farmer-based organizations on the ground, or working with local IT providers who can market their services to female, small and medium enterprises, um, and really empowering local ecosystem actors in ways that we um, maybe haven't been as, as systematic about before. Um, the second thing is emphasizing the responsible use of digital technology. Michelle spoke about this. Um, this is really links to you know, open source um, and reuse in terms of the digital principles. And we are increasingly aware of the digital downsides and the risks that the increased prevalence of data 
um, of personal information, um, as well as, you know, when we take a digital first approach, we need to have as the backbone of that, focusing on building the digital capacity of the, and understanding around privacy and security within um, the people we're working with, within the ecosystem itself, really at the earliest stages. So that as we roll out these new tools, they can have the impacts that they want them to, and we can achieve those benefits um, and those goals. Um, there's different ways to do this, you know, things like making sure we understand the users as well as the gaps kind of in the regulatory space that exist in, mar in the markets and countries where we're working. There's also some interesting things around automation. So we've built a tool that um, it's a machine learning algorithm that looks across all the data we're collecting to flag personally identifiable information. So looking for those opportunities to use digital tools, you know, in order to be responsible, I think there's a lot of promise and opportunity. The third piece is around uh, what we've been talking about in terms of digital ecosystems and making sure that as we support and analyze and work with actors in the digital ecosystems, we're still maintaining that link with the user, which is the first principle um, of the, the principles for digital development. So making sure that we're um, integrating the users into the design process and integrating them into both those opportunities and maybe some of the challenges that exist in the digital ecosystem. An example of this is um, we have a program in Uganda that's working with um, the ag sector. And we found earlier this year that there was a really excellent um, opportunity to work with small rural farmers um, on connecting with sellers of inputs through a, virtu through a digital app. Um, however, so they, you know, they were using the app. It was well-designed. They were part of that process. However, the internet was so slow in the rural areas where they lived, where they would you know, send their order in, but then they'd have to call and follow up with the sellers to let them know the order was coming. So this is really just to highlight that, you know, we can put our best intentions forward, but making sure that the infrastructure, the ecosystem itself is there to support those digital goals is a really critical piece that um, is throws flows throughout the strategy. And then lastly, kind of on that note, making sure that we're creating cost-effective and efficient ways to understand the digital ecosystems. And that's something that I know Michelle and Craig think about on a regular basis, um, and that we're really thankful to be able to work with them on ways to bring together um, new data sets, existing data sets across the ecosystem to look at how things are performing and key drivers at, at the ecosystem level. And this is another er great area for collaboration where we as a implementing partners and as a sector can um, look for ways to share our data, share what we're learning so that other, uh, uh, both the local institutions tying back to digital self-reliance as well as um, development programs can really benefit. I'll turn it back to you so we can hear more uh, from you, Manisha, and from Craig. Thank you, Krista. Really appreciate that. Uh, so Craig, DECA, I think by this point, everybody is very interested in this, right? Digital Ecosystem Country Assessment. Um, I recall that Columbia DECA was released a few months ago, I think July, maybe August. Yeah. And I understand there are a few more in the works. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Th thanks, Manisha. So yeah. Um, so yeah, if you could walk I, us, if you could do a DECA 101 for us, that would be awesome. <laughs> absolutely. I'm happy to do that. Um, so as, uh, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to get to share a bit about what we're up to with this audience. As, as Michelle mentioned earlier, the DECA is one piece of the broader implementation effort for the USA digital strategy. And so we are... Um, our, our goal with the DECA is really to help missions to make informed decisions about how they're engaging with digital ecosystems in the countries where they work. That we, um, we want, you know, we know that our colleagues in missions have expertise in a lot of different areas, and we're trying to supplement that with more information about what's happening in digital. And so you can see on the slide this maybe kind of intimidating and overwhelming graphic that we've put up here. Uh, but the, the main thing to focus on is these three circles that you're seeing there. So the first one on the lower left is looking at digital infrastructure and access. And so the, the main thing we're interested in there is trying to understand, on the one hand, what are the technologies and the systems that are allowing people to get online and shaping the experience they have when they're there? 
And also in particular, where are some of the gaps and inequities in access, whether that's with regard to a digital gender divide or a geographic divide, or whether it's limitations in digital literacy, this is where we're interested in the things that are keeping people from being able to participate fully in the digital world. Uh, the second broad area at the top, um, we're interested in digital society and governance. And there we're interested in a few different things. One of these is e-government broadly. We want to understand how governments are turning to digital channels to deliver more ser citizen services. And we're finding that nearly every government in the world has an e-government strategy. And we're looking to understand what those are including and how they're being implemented. Uh, we're also interested in some of these risks, uh, whether those are around privacy and data protection or whether they're around things like censorship and disinformation. Uh, we want to understand how, how people's freedoms are either being advanced or being constrained by things that are happening in the digital space. And then the third area is the digital economy. Uh, this is something, of course, that people in our organization have been interested in for a very long time. Uh, we have people, we're, or rather, we're looking at um, things like digital finance and payment systems, as well as digital trade and e-commerce, and the the ways in which the economic growth of countries where we're working is moving into the digital space. So, as you mentioned, Manisha, uh, we've completed two pilots. Uh, the first two were in Colombia and in Kenya. And those two reports are both public now, and I don't have to worry about them anymore, which is a huge relief to me. Uh, we're currently working on wrapping up the second set of pilots. These are in Nepal and in Serbia. And we're hoping we're currently in the writing process with those. And so we're hoping to have those publicly available before the end of the year, if we're fortunate. And then looking forward uh, over the next year, we're hoping to roll the DECA out to a larger number of missions uh, to get broader geographic coverage, to get experience working in different kinds of operating environments, and really to see how well this model that we've developed during the pilot phase holds up when we try to do it in more places. And so one of the things we're doing to facilitate that is trying to put together a toolkit of standard operating procedures and templates that can be used. And our intention is to make those materials open source so that other organizations can adapt them for their needs. And I guess the, the point I want to close on is that our, our primary audience, first and foremost, is our colleagues in USAID missions. However, we also want to make sure that the DECA is a resource that's going to be useful for the broader development community. So on that note, as we get into the Q&A, I'd be really interested to hear about what features people think will help to make an assessment like this useful for their organization's work. Thank you, Craig. That is a beautiful graphic and what I call a comprehensive 101. <laughs> On your last point, um, how do we reach out to you? Is there a place for public uh, page for public comments? How do the panel participants or audience uh, send suggestions or additional DECA features that they would like to see? I, I can answer that I, one if you want, Craig. Um, please. We have a general e email. It's digitaldevelopment at usaid.gov. That is our inbox and someone's always monitoring it. So rather than sending an email and maybe not getting a response, if you send it to that one, it will absolutely be uh, forwarded to the right person. So again, digitaldevelopment at usaid.gov. Awesome. Thank you. And one more question for you, Michelle, before we open up for questions. Uh, Craig talked about DECA. Does the center have plans for other products in addition to DECAs? Like what is, what are we, what should we um, look for in the coming months and years? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking that. Yes, we are, as I mentioned, we are doing lots of landscape analyses. Um, we're doing a lot of defining, like, for example, what is cybersecurity as a development factor? What, what should we do? What should we not do? We're working through all of that right now and our plans are to develop either toolkits or primers that will be public so that everyone can see what we found and what we are thinking about as a development agency. So very specifically, we, um, we're working on a cybersecurity primer. And uh, again, the idea behind this is where does cybersecurity fit into our program cycle? When we're thinking of doing a five-year strategic plan, 
where does cybersecurity fit in in our pads, in our activity designs, all from that side. And they were also doing sector looks at, you know, what are the specific risks in, say, the health sector versus the um, environment sector or the democracy sector, and really trying to build out some evidence around that. Um, we'll be doing something similar for digital literacy, uh, defining it, uh, seeing how it's already being used in our programming and seeing uh, where we need to, you know, we have gaps and we need to build out evidence base. So we're doing those types of primers for each of the second track. So um, I think the one that's gonna come out publicly rather soon is uh, gender. We have a gender desk review where we've been looking a lot around harms um, tied to closing the digital gender divide. We've, we've been doing a lot of work over the last five to 10 years on all the great opportunities of bringing women and, and girls online um, and the, you know, all the different gender dynamics. But moving forward, we really need to look at what potential risks are there as well. And so we're trying to kind of, again, round out our knowledge base. So we'll be having a primer coming out and a, a, a toolkit desk review. Um, we're also, for the track three on the operations side, we're going to be updating the uh, digital payments toolkit that came out in 2014 together with the procurement executive bulletin that said, you know, implementing partners must use digital payments. Uh, it, a lot has happened in the digital landscape since 2014. So we thought it was time for an update. So that one will be coming out, you know, in the next couple of months, of course, you know, with our, our clearances, you never know, <laughs> but it is in process and that will be coming out. Um, so we'll be doing things like that. And then we're also going to be, as I mentioned, doing a lot of training for USAID. One of the things that we're looking at is can we make any of our training publicly available? Obviously, we're looking a lot at digital training right now and maybe walking yourself through some of these toolkits that we're developing. So whenever possible, we're going to try to make our, our training and our materials public. Um, and that's where we have it on digital development development.org. So that is our public facing uh, website where we will be able to put all of these relevant uh, documents, products, information for the larger development community. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and one additional question for Craig. Um, is the, uh, you know, how can implementers use DECA? I mean, you know, I understand that it's a tool primarily intended for the missions, but can the implementers also start using it in some way? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, so I picture it at least being useful for two different things, right? One is just as an information resource. And we, you know, you saw there's an awful lot that goes into this. And so um, we're, we're aiming to be broad. And honestly, we're, we're hoping that it turns out to be useful to some extent to the people that we interview. Um, that, of course, if we, you know, if we digital, if we interview someone who is, for example, a civil society activist, they probably know more than we could ever hope to about their area of expertise. And we're just offering a summary there. But hopefully we can round out that picture for them a little bit by helping them to better understand some pieces of the ecosystem that they maybe don't engage with quite as often. So that's one piece, just the informative aspect. I think the other one is part of the service that we try to provide for the mission is to connect our findings as well as possible to the mission's strategy and to the mission's priorities. And a lot of the people who we're talking to are, um, you know, they might be, they might be people who don't interact with USAID on a day-to-day -day basis. We talk to telecom regulators and startup investors and you know, people who aren't generally in USAID's orbit. And so hopefully this can serve for them as kind of an introduction to USAID and to help them understand what the mission's priorities are, what kinds of things USAID is interested in, and where that connects with the world that they live and work in. Thank you. Appreciate that. Actually, I wanted to just uh, plus one on what Craig was saying, and I'm sure Krista probably has some thoughts on this as well. Um, for, for our implementing partner community specifically, um, 
I think it's a great, I mean, I think it would be a very useful overview to, to, to demonstrate how USAID is seeing it. Not that the way we're seeing it is holistic. We, we, we're definitely not trying to claim we're doing a full assessment of an entire digital ecosystem. As Craig said, it's very much tied to USAID's portfolio um, in the country. But I do think it's a strong signal of what we found and how we're framing it and how we're seeing it. So I think it would definitely inform implementing partners that are already working in country or that are interested in working in country about the digital opportunities and risks that are there. Um, so that when programming is taking place or when there's any type of you know, procurement pro uh, process, they understand already a little bit about the dynamics in the ecosystem. So I think it could definitely be, as Craig said, an informative tool. Um, but also we, we know that USAID is maybe not as advanced as our partners in a lot of these spaces, to be perfectly frank. I mean, Manisha, you taught me about media literacy, right? Um, so I would say that it could also be an opportunity for our partners to come and have conversations conversations with USAID. Oh, you found this. Actually, we've been working on this. Because sometimes USAID, I mean, you know how it is. We, we may not know the details. An AOR may not even know the question to ask to say, oh, you're doing this? Or this is something really interesting. So I would just invite our implementing partners to read those and say, oh, I can now have these conversations with USAID that maybe before there wasn't a signal of interest. Um, and, and really use it to start those conversations. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if Krista wanted to add something to that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I would just add a couple points. I think um, to Michelle's point, having this common language and a way to engage with USAID on these topics is just going to be amazing for us as implementing partners and, and being able to say even you know, to ourselves as we're preparing for opportunities or as we're looking at what's happening in a country to have sort of that graphic in mind and think about the sector we're working in or um, the, uh, the segment of the population we're working with and be able to craft then um, you know, questions um, and look for opportunities to engage in new ways. Um, and I think for those of us in the digital sector, it's a really important tool for some internal conversations too, to say, you know, USAID's committed to this. Um, how can we as an organization uh, plan and prepare for this? How can we engage with USAID? How can we do better development work, you know, integrating these, these digital um, space, the integrating the digital space and the different actors in the digital ecosystem that may have been overlooked um, in previous, you know, projects or planning. Um, so I just think it's, it's a really great to have this, this common uh, tool uh, to, to use for all these purposes. That is so true. Uh, thank you so much for that addition. Um, I think we have questions coming in and we have 20 minutes left. Um, all good things come to an end. So I want to make sure that we get all the questions out as many as we can. Um, so the first question is, uh, I think either for Michelle or for um, Craig, but maybe for Michelle, um, you, mentioned the US, you mentioned that USAID will require all data to come in digitally. Will this be in year three and beyond after the foundation period? Uh, yeah, so that is actually not, I should have clarified that. That is work that our CIO office is, is working on. Um, so I, I really am not qualified to talk about the requirements of having it come in. I just wanted to say that like, that's a process that's going in as part of the overall digitization. But what we're focused on in the strategy is the collection of data digitally. We know that it's faster, cheaper, and more accurate to collect data digitally. We also know that there's some hesitation and risks in certain environments where the beneficiaries may not feel comfortable sharing data if it's going through digitally. So what we are really looking at under the digital strategy is the idea of data collection um, because we know that USA will be eventually requiring it to come in digitally. So we're trying to make sure that that process is as smooth as possible. And then we're also really working to make sure that um, we're aware of what those risks and barriers may be. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Krista wants to jump in because I know recently you were on a panel where digital data collection was discussed. So you have any and thoughts? He, that's a really good segue to uh, Krista because there is a question uh, specifically for Krista on data sharing. And, you know, if you could speak a little bit more about what is working well with data sharing and what today's challenges are. 
Sure. And I'll give a shout out to an event that Interaction and Sid Washington put together, the ICT Working Group in Sid Washington, um, last week, I believe, on uh, data um, related to the digital strategy. And there is a real effort underway um, by those organizations to collect data and understand what challenges um, implementing partners and other actors in this in our space are facing in order that, um, you know, further tools and guidance could be provided, you know, kind of within the sector itself. So I would encourage people to follow up, find that there's an interaction survey that they've put out and, um, and participate in that. Um, in terms of data collection, I think uh, one of the things that we found as an organization is that, um, you know, being able to either invest in or, um, or procure kind of a common data collection platform for mobile data collection, um, whether that's open source or proprietary, is an important, uh, I think, point right now in development because that allows us as organizations to better connect that data back to USAID as we'll need to do over the coming years, but also then for us to look across our portfolios and see what we might be learning and where there may be challenges. Um, and then I'll, but I'll just underscore Michelle's points that um, we found that in certain settings, particularly where there might be, you know, instability or, or govern, you know, different types of government regimes, um, you do need to be really cautious about mo mobile data collection, um, you know, uh, devices and that whole process itself and, and creating trust um, with the people you're collecting the data from. And so I think that's where um, the digital default with that flexibility to obviously, you know, work safely within the environment is really critical. Um, and then I, the other point I'll make about data collection um, is just that I think that We've done a lot of on the ground kind of one on one um, data collection efforts through our Frontier Insights tool, um, where we kind of look at dig into different um, different segments of the population. And it's really important to think about gender um, and sort of the, the dynamics of data collection, um, which I think is an important important part of, of the digital strategy strategy and it's there and it's just something for us to continue to talk about. Thank you, Krista. So the next question is about uh, designing for inclusion and access. Um, and the question is, how do you seek to leverage exciting digital innovations happening on the ground around the globe already, especially at the local level to support USCID mission and goals for the digital strategy? That's a great question and one that I've not yet had yet. So um, I really need to think through that a little bit. Obviously, everything that we do is all about our missions and happening in countries. And so I would say the, the first point, entry point of being able to identify what's happening on the ground and being able to collect that and share that information has to come from our missions. And this is why having a digital data advisor, a person who is dedicated to focusing on the digital ecosystem in country is so critical. I mean, again, as a foreign service officer, I've had to wear 25 hats, you know, depending on, oh, you're going to be the youth advisor, you're going to be the gender. So we wanted someone who really knows the space and we're actually developing a lot of specialized training for our digital development and advisors because we're really asking them to be magical unicorns that can do everything from 5G spectrum allocation to understanding disinformation to mobile money. I mean, we know that that's probably not it, but we at least want them to understand those terms. So the idea behind it would be at the mission level, engaging, maybe they've just done a fabulous DECA, maybe through Craig and his team, they now have a whole new group of folks that they could start engaging with to identify this. But ideally it would be coming in through the missions. We've also changed some of the internal USA reporting processes, and I don't know how much you all want to know about our internal bureaucratic changes, but we do have a special one where um, we are asking for reporting on technology and anything tied to digital development so that if there are these types of innovations, we have a way to capture them because quite frankly, inside of USAID, previously it Technology reporting was kind of blended with some other things. So what we've done is pull it out. For those of you who care, it's the STI. We've pulled out the um, technology part of the science, innovation, and technology key issue so that we can capture this kind of information. I would say that's the first place I would start. And then secondly, 
digitaldevelopment at usaid.gov. <laughs> we definitely like to hear about this. We, um, in the Center for Digital Development, we also have the Digi Awards, where we want to acknowledge some of the most innovative digital solutions taking place around the world so we can honor those and collect those and, and really elevate that work. So we have a few different ways to do it, but I would say again, the entry point is really through the missions. Awesome, thank you. So the next question is about um, promoting open ecosystems and solutions and open source. Um, so great panel, promoting open ecosystems and solutions is a great is a key to supporting the journey for self-reliance. However, proprietary tools still offer better, more reliable solutions in a number of areas. Can Craig or Michelle share some thoughts on how to assess the pros and cons of using proprietary versus open tools when implementing USAID projects? Craig, do you want to take that one or do you want me to? I, I can try. Um, that, <laughs> so it, it's complicated, right? And you can, you can kind of hear that in the question that there's something that, that there's two sides to it that I think in you know, in a lot of cases, open source software is really great. Um, I use it, you know, for everything that I'm able to, which is, of course, actually not everything, right? There's there are some cases where you have a prior, proprietary solution with no really good substitute. And so we've, since the principles for digital development came back, came out years ago, people have been going back and forth on this, that we don't want to be dogmatic and insist that everything has to be open source just sort of as a point of ideology. Um, my, my inclination is to back that up a step and ask, why is it that we like open source to begin with? And I think sometimes it's more cost effective. It isn't always. Um, there's, there's an old joke in the software community that open source is not free like pizza, it's free like puppies. Um, you you get it, but then it takes a lot of work and sometimes a lot of expense to care for it. I think the real key is avoiding lock-in to a specific vendor and to a specific format. We see so many cases where a government or an organization will pay for a proprietary solution and then find the costs of that to be unsustainable over time, but have a really difficult time switching to something else because they've now built their entire, um, their entire work process around one particular company's solutions. And so to me, the really key thing to having an open ecosystem isn't necessarily having all software be open source as much as it's prioritizing interoperability and making sure that data can be moved from one platform to another uh, because that's something that facilitates genuine competition, which is the real thing that helps keep prices down. So the next question, uh, how can USAID ensure that it's worldwide development efforts, technologies don't increase inequalities, social and economic, just because it is difficult for millions of people to access ICTs? How can we ensure that we are not promoting inequality? Mm -hmm. Increasing Again, inequality. Going back to the fundamental goals of this is you know open secure and inclusive and and part of that inclusivity is exactly addressing this particular dynamic it's understanding where are the challenges and then what development solutions do we have available to try and rectify those types of solutions. Um, I mean, again, this is going back to, I, I just always go to objective one of making sure that our USAID staff and our implementing partners understand digital technology and the responsible use. And part of that responsibility has got to be tied to cost. Now, of course, we can work together potentially to address cost and to raise the issues around cost. Let's say um, you're working together uh, with the telecom industry in a specific country to lower um, at use costs in certain rural areas. That is definitely demand aggregation, right? There's definitely um, some models we have out there where we've been trying to address 
that kind of issue. You know, we're looking a lot at connectivity and helping communities. You know, Craig might want to talk about this in the Columbia DECA. You know, we found communities that were setting up their own mesh networks and how can we just potentially, you know, put a, a wire from that major telecom provider to be able to increase access at a very low cost rate. So we're looking at lots of different ways to do it, but just rest assured for whoever asked that question that that is one of the fundamental principles of the digital strategy of saying how can we make sure access and inclusivity are core to everything so I don't have a simple answer because none of this is simple but it is in the foundation but I don't know Krista or Craig if you wanted to jump in and, and offer some thoughts on that one. Yeah, I mean, I would just second all of those um, suggestions, Michelle, and I think that there are models out there um, that that we've seen, and I think that it's um, it's really about also asking ourselves the question of like, you know, for this activity or for this initiative or for this project, who are we not including? And making sure that we're sort of asking that question at the outset, you know, digitally speaking and in general, and then making sure that that we we understand what the risks are there and we're kind of designing to mitigate those as much as we can. There's a related question, I think. Uh, uh, what about smallholder farmers, women and girls in remote areas? Will future USAID projects demand teaching and purchasing mobiles? Well, again, I, I want to just echo what Craig said. It's not that we're trying to be prescriptive. And what I said at the very start, we're not trying to introduce technology simply for technology's sake. It has to be tied to the overarching goals of whatever the activity are. It's simply saying that we are in a digital revolution and to not include that as part of the considerations in any kind of design are, are really unfair to our beneficiary population and to our partner nation. So it's not that we're saying everyone needs a mobile phone, but rather what is the challenge we're trying to face? Is there a digital technology that could help provide some type of solution, right? Like on the ideas around mobile money, let's use that as an example. It, what's better to have a telephone distribution and working with a telecom company to expand coverage out into rural areas or sending our implementing partner staff with a truck full of cash and a couple security guards to go pay workers, you know, in one case, it might be safer to send out that truck of cash. And another case that not, again, it's all about doing the analysis for each individual instance and in saying, what is the best way to do it? And if there is a digital solution, how can we potentially implement that? And then build in the digital literacy, build in the opportunities, because once someone does have a mobile phone and they have technology and access to the internet, it opens up a whole lot of other dynamics that maybe just a truck full of cash in that particular example would not. So again, not a simple answer, but the idea is constantly looking at those risks and rewards and figuring out the best solution. So it's really up to us to make sure our workforce is prepared for that. So thank you, Michelle. So last question, I think, because we're coming to uh, the end of the panel, all good things come to an end, unfortunately. <laughs> what can missions use the funds from the Digital Ecosystem Fund for? This is a lot of me talking today. Sure. Um, so the Digital <laughs> Fund is essentially looking at two different levels of opportunity. One are kind of short-term unexpected opportunities or risks that might emerge where um, uh, there is an election and, oh, we have this great civil society organization that wants to do a lot of digital literacy education around a new app that the government is introducing, or we want to do a communications campaign around digital IDs, something like that. A mission could apply for something like that. It's very like concrete, maybe hiring um, a consultant to help build out uh, digital working groups in the region that are looking at shared digital technologies or incorporating the principles. It can be used for a lot of things that are kind of more on a small scale. What we're envisioning is there's also a secondary um, application that could be very transformational for the ecosystem. So for example, if a country suddenly um, decides to privatize its telecom, telecom industry and requests help from USAID and it's going to be a multi-year process that involves bringing in lawyers and blah, 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 then USAID could develop a multi-year project that had a very catalytic ecosystem level change. Our intent is to have more of the ecosystem level, of course, than like the smaller uh, ones, but we, we don't want to limit it because we also know these like small moments of opportunity could potentially open up into ecosystem level change later. So there's kind of two levels that we're going to be looking at. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. I think that brings us to the end of this panel. 
a virtual round of applause to our wonderful panelists. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, for an excellent high-level walkthrough of the digital strategy and its rollout and sort of answering all the questions you had a few too many, <laughs> I think, today. Um, and Craig for laying out the components of the country digital ecosystem. Thank you also to Krista for your insights on how implementers can thoughtfully start integrating digital now and into the future. This has been a really exciting time, uh, this panel. And you know, I think the future is really exciting for us, those of us working in digital, in the ICTs, in T4Ds, ag tech, civic tech, whatever you choose, right? The opportunities are many but as are the risks and we'll need to carefully balance both as Michelle said, right? A huge thank you also to our participants and audience members for your wonderful questions and comments and for Pebbles and our technical support team. Have a wonderful rest of the day and please enjoy other panels as well.